On the attacks on Asian spas in Atlanta, shaking people across the tri-state and the nation. The Asian community already living in fear amid an increase in hate crimes against them. Now even more worried after a gunman killed eight people, six of them Asian women. Such crimes growing across the country, including in New York City. It is the first of many topics we're going to discuss in our bi-weekly segment, one-on-one -on -one with New York City Police Commissioner Dermot Shea. And the commissioner joins me now. Good morning to you, Commissioner. Good to see you. Good to see you, Dan. So, Commissioner, I do want to begin on such a serious note here because you have deployed these critical response command teams yep. in Asian communities, spas across the city. What is being done, though, to stop the hate and violence that we have seen to ease the fears of New Yorkers? Yeah, a lot of prongs and, and very important topic, Dan. Within minutes of, of that terrible incident in, in Georgia, uh, we were in contact with authorities in Georgia, our intelligence bureau, our operations unit here. We were deploying resources across New York City to some of the Asian uh, communities, specifically in Flushing, in mm -hmm. Chinatown, in, in South Brooklyn. But, but beyond the, the deployment, Dan, which, which will continue, uh, there's also a conversation that has to take place, and that's an important aspect of this, too. So we'll continue to meet with members of the Asian community, what we can do together. And I think it's going to, as we've said this before, it's, it's going to take all New Yorkers coming together and standing up and saying no to hate. It, it certainly is, and it's conversations like you and I are having, too, to raise the awareness, too, and raise the red flags. And, you know, I want to talk about some of the numbers because they're alarming. So far this year, there have been at least 10 suspected anti-Asian hate crimes in this city. In 2020, just for perspective, there were 29, most of which were attributed to coronavirus motivation. Now, we have seen... Asian American shoved and punched. One of the most recent Monday occurred when a man threw liquid on a woman's neck at West 37th Street and 8th Avenue. I'm sure you know about this. Any update on this or any of the investigations? No, those numbers are right in terms of the 10 this year. And, and the more important thing here, I think, is that we think those numbers are much higher. And I don't think too many people would disagree with that. And that's kind of the impetus behind the Asian uh, Hate Crimes Task Force that was built last year from the ground up to supplement our already existing yeah. Hate Crimes Task Force, trying to build that bridge with the community and getting people comfortable in, and, and making them aware of why it's so important to report any incidents of hate, whether it's speech, whether it's harassment, or whether it's a violent crime, because that person is probably doing it to someone else too. And we need everyone to report this. Uh, come together and, and then we'll put our detectives on it. But you, you know, can go to at NYPD tips right now mm -hmm. and you can see some posters that we need help with. You know, Commissioner, I want to say on this for a second, if you don't mind, because you just said something that I want to dive into for a second, and that is that you think the number is higher. So is, it, it, is there a fear of people coming forward? And why is that fear? Why does it exist to report? Yeah, so I think for us in law enforcement, we're well aware that whatever the reported crime is, traditionally now, we're getting uh, into a pretty deep topic, but there's always going to be crime that's unreported. And we think that there's some, in some instances, in some communities, um, whether it's culture or other yeah. issues, that, that may be a little higher. And I think this is one of these uh, examples. So, you know, I got to give Stu Lu, our inspector, mm -hmm. a lot of credit in reaching across the NYPD, reaching across to trained investigators uh, of Asian heritage and, and reaching into them and, and building really a, a, a team of yeah. such skilled individuals that are trying to really combat this problem from the ground up. Understood. You know, I do want to move on, Commissioner, to something that you and I have talked about a number of times. In late February, you apologized for systemic racism within the department. The update here, though, in the past few days, the mayor has come out, introduced the second part of his police reform plan, five themes which include decriminalization, de decriminalizing poverty, recognizing historic and modern-day radicalized policing, transparency, and accountability. Do you support those five pillars that are now on the screen? Yeah, I do. And when you look, Dan, at this plan, I think if you real, it's, a, it's quite a read. Mm -hmm. it, it, you start to realize that this is much beyond. This is one of the real important themes that Jennifer, Wes, and Arva wanted to highlight, I believe. They, they'll speak for themselves, that this goes much beyond policing and, and ma building equity in neighborhoods. So when you look at those things, um, absolutely, you know, we're on board. I think we're an agency that has been... Um, reforming for seven years now mm -hmm. and we're not done and and it's going to continue and and uh, an important note here is for the first time in years you can take a police test next month for three weeks only so if, if you still see things that you don't want to change 
and you love New York City, uh, be a part of that change and take the test. Uh, you can't decide you want to be a cop two months from now. You got to be on that first test, and it's only a three week sign up yeah. next month. So yeah. great job and great opportunity for people. I think that's very important, and we will highlight that in the month of April as well. Late last week, I want to say on this topic of race, you met with Eric Garner's mother, Gwen Carr, as well as the brother of George mm -hmm. Floyd. Now, I've spoken to Gwen a number of times right here on the morning news about change that she wants to see. What did you learn from the conversations with those two? Uh, it was just about really, it was. <laughs> The humanity and the listening uh, with both Terrence and Gwen and uh, you know they both lost loved ones and what do you say to a person that has lost a life every loss of life is tragic that was about uh, myself and Ben Tucker uh, took part in that with uh, Reverend Foy and Reverend McCall and uh, it was about listening it was about hearing their voices and it was about trying to find a path forward together I mean that was the, the key themes there you know, something that Gwen has talked about involves this disciplinary matrix, right? And she said that she wanted to see it even go further. And that brings me to my next question here of state lawmakers this week, Commissioner, introducing legislation to take the final say on the discipline of officers away from you and into the hands of a civilian watchdog group. Your thoughts on that? Uh, I'm going to be real clear, and I've said it a couple of times. I think this would be a mistake. And I think before we pass laws, we got to go a little bit slow here, Dan, and, and make sure we don't do things, because we've done it before in recent years, that have unintended consequences. Uh, there's, a, there's a pretty uh, clear line of accountability right now. Mm -hmm. If I do a bad job, I get fired. Um, I hire the cops. I train the cops. I certainly put them into harm's way and ask them to keep New Yorkers safe. I discipline them. And then if they do wrong, I fire them. To take that away from me, I would ask you, Dan, who has the accountability then? And, and you got to look at data of other studies that have been done already that show that in, in small numbers of places that have tried this, it has actually backfired, where the accountability, the discipline that is meted out is less than if the police chiefs had done it. So well, I'm pretty strong against this for those reasons. A lot of times they say they want to give it to the Civilian Complaint Review Board to have them make the final determination, right? Yep, all, all of those reasons I just said, Dan. Yep. I mean, no one has a better idea of the intricacies uh, behind the scenes than, than we do. And, and that, that accountability is right here in front of everyone. I want to just touch upon it, what the New York Post is reporting this morning. Not sure if you saw it about the NYPD blowing past its overtime budget at a time when there were still the calls to defund the police movement. What is your response to that article? Was it accurate? And, and how did it happen, really? Yeah, overtime is, is, a, is a critical component of how we keep New Yorkers safe. Like every agency, we're under pretty strict constraints, and we recognize that. I'd highlight a couple things. In June 30th, with that budget that was passed, our overtime was cut 59%. We, I think we all know what came in the summer after that. We've put strict controls in place, and we've cut the overtime. I believe the most recent number, Dan, uh, since June 30th is over 40%. But we have not at this point. The, yeah. the article is right. We have gone over for some of the reasons I think we all know, whether it's the continuing protests, the continuing uh, violence that we have to get our arms around, and the pretty significant attrition with uh, right now on the street about 3,400 cops down until some of these cops get out of the academy. Well, so well, also, you've gotten into the back. We're doing a good job in cutting the overtime, but we, we can still work to find some other avenues. Understood. And, you, and you've gotten into the vaccine game, right? To the coronavirus we go. Where does the department and uniformed civilians actually work? Uh, where are you in terms of numbers of those getting vaccinated? Because I also understand that you, within the NYPD, the medical unit, is helping now to administer vaccines to the community. Yeah, we're, we're, we're at 34 percent of our uh, workforce right now has been vaccinated. It's probably a little higher. That's the most recent number I've seen. And, and uh, for this month at 127 Penn at the community center, uh, we did a press conference there with Chief Marty Morales and Chief Jeff Madry. Uh, I'm very proud of this one. W the community center is open to the community. Uh, NYPD members that are trained are giving vaccines out. And that's not enough, Dan. So mm -hmm. we're driving around to some of the areas that need it the most, whether it's housing developments or other areas, picking up people and bringing them to get their shots. So very proud of that work. Yeah, understood. And, you know, Commissioner, it's the day after St. Patrick's Day. I just wanted to get your thoughts on what exactly you did yesterday, because two years in a row, no parade. But did you get your corned beef and cabbage is the question. 
I absolutely did. I had beef stew uh, for lunch and corned beef last night. Thank you to my uh, lovely <laughs> wife who did a great job. And, uh, you know, other than that, I have a pretty boring life, so I was in bed early. But did she cook it for eight hours? No, it wasn't eight hours, but she did a great job. You're trying to get me in trouble? No, no, no. You know, she, the, the wife never does wrong, ever, right? Always does everything correctly, never. and everything never. always it tastes was delicious. amazing. Exactly. It was delicious. Commissioner Dermot Shea, until next time, thank you for being here again for this conversation. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan.